All right, everybody, welcome back to the third installment of Science and Application with Eric Helms, pronounced as you know, Say what? Today we're going to tackle the issue of how much does hypertrophy contribute to strength. This is obviously important because it can dictate how we should train. If you're a power lifter, how much time should you spend trying to promote hypertrophy? And if you are a bodybuilder, does strength even relate to hypertrophy at all? How much do you need to pay attention to it? So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to go th through some of the research on it, some of the controversy, try to clear it up, and try to give you a picture of how you might want to train based on this information. So first off, let's talk about the contributors to strength as a whole. Now, if anyone has read my Muscle and Strength Pyramid Strength book, uh, or training book rather, I, I talk about basically motor skill, neurological adaptations, and hypertrophy in a general sense because it's easier to understand. But we're going to get into the weeds a little bit more today, and we're going to talk about some more specific adaptations. Largely, you can categorize them into neuromuscular and morphological. So when I say morphological, that's a weird sounding term, but really it just means the morphology or the architecture. It incorporates, it, sorry, encompasses things not only about muscle size, but the actual structure of the muscle itself and how it changes to allow for greater strength. So in terms of neuromuscular adaptations that allow greater strength, a big part of that is just motor skill development. Uh, and what this looks like on a more micro level is the intramuscular coordination, so inter being between muscles. So this is sequencing and timing of muscular contractions and having the appropriate uh, amplitude of each muscle contracting in such a way to produce a movement and having the timing right so that there's a smooth force transmission throughout the movement. So not only is uh, motor skill something that's more cerebral and you're thinking about what's the proper way to perform the movement, but there are actual changes going on uh, in, in, the mo in, in the motor learning that, that relate to muscles talking to one another, and there's even intramuscular coordination uh, and, and force transference across the muscle. Uh, we also see uh, increased motor unit activation, essentially the agonist, the, the muscle that is actually contracting and moving uh, the, uh, the body through space or moving the object or uh, shifting or attempting to shift in an isometric contraction, the load um, is getting more active. It's getting a, an increased signal. Uh, that can come through an increase in, in firing rate or rate coding, and that can actually be just a greater amount of agonist drive. So essentially, there's a lot of changes to the neuromuscular system, both at the site of the muscle and centrally, uh, that result in a greater strength output, being able to increase force. Now that said, the central nervous system has to be activating something, right? So those motor units have to be tied into something else, and those are, of course, muscle fibers, and that's what makes up muscle. So uh, obviously, and you can see at the bottom there, hypertrophy. So if you have more muscle, uh, larger muscles means more contractile tissue, uh, greater you know, cross-sectional area means greater force transmission, greater force output, and that is actually what the nervous system is activating to produce force. Uh, but beyond just hypertrophy, there's a lot of other architectural changes. So, for example, the actual angle of the muscle fibers uh, changes, and this is what's called, especially in pinnate muscle, a pinnation angle change, which allows essentially more uh, hypertrophy to fit in the same area, and essentially increasing what's known as physiological cross-sectional area. Uh, and this allows a uh, you know, greater amount of, of force produced in the muscle. Uh, additionally, there are other aspects of the muscle that produce force that are not contractile. Uh, so this is uh, elastic or connective tissue changes, uh, things like the tendon uh, gaining more stiffness uh, and, and maybe very slowly hypertrophying to some extent to transfer uh, the force from the muscle to the bone and then, thus resulting in action and movement. And also within the muscle itself, uh, there, is, there is also elastic tissue uh, that responds to a stretch shortening cycle that allows you to transmit force across the muscle. And that's, uh, among other things, tighten, which is a, uh, a, a connective tissue within the muscle itself. And there's different isoforms of that, and it's a new area of research, very interesting. But it's not all contractile tissue. A lot of it is related to force transmission. And the ability to produce force has a lot of different things that, that all come into play. So moving on. Uh, let's talk about the role of hypertrophy. So this is actually just the muscle increasing in size in terms of strength performance. Uh, when you take a look at the performance in strength sport, specifically right here I'm talking about strongman, Olympic lifting, and, and uh, powerlifting, 
the amount of lean body mass that someone carries and some of their anthropometric characteristics, so how much muscle mass they have, has a huge predictive factor uh, for how well someone might perform. So for example, if you were to just plot along a linear line performance in strongmen and novice strongmen, you'd find that about 40% of what went into or predicting that variance in performance in novice strongmen was contributed to how much lean body mass they would have. Uh, and this might be higher in, in, in non-novices because uh, it is in Olympic lifters and power lifters. Uh, and this is something we'll talk about later that perhaps with increasing training age, uh, the, the role of hypertrophy plays a larger relative importance in terms of performance. Not that you're gaining more hypertrophy later in your training, just that the, the role of neurological adaptations might be relatively less compared to hypertrophy. Uh, and in, so it's only 40% in novice strongmen, but when you're looking at elite Olympic lifters and elite power lifters, you have very high percentages of predictive value related to their lean body mass and their performance. So something like 70 to 80%, depending on the lift, uh, of the variance explained in how much someone can snatch, clean and jerk, or front or back squat. Uh, and elite Olympic lifters is explained by how much lean body mass they're carrying. And similarly, in power lifters, uh, 74 to 90% of the performance in the big three, depending on the lift, is explained by how much lean body mass they are carrying. Uh, now, it's an important distinction that this is cross-sectional information, meaning that we've taken a group of Olympic lifters, power lifters, or strongmen, and we have just said, okay, What's your performance like? We'll write that down as a data point. How much lean body mass you're carrying? We do an anthropometry test of some sort and see how they relate. Uh, this is not necessarily saying um, that the, 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 the change from the, where they started to where they went is 70 to 80% related to their, their strength, if that makes sense. So if you could somehow disassociate uh, hypertrophy from strength training. If you just stepped in the in the weight room and you trained and you only got neurological adaptations and there was no hypertrophy, uh, this is not saying uh, that you'd only get 20% of the performance. Um, in fact, we're going to talk about how much does the change in strength over time relate to hypertrophy. And despite these very high baseline correlations or cross-sectional correlations in strength athletes, uh, you might be surprised to find that they're not quite as high. Uh, but so let's talk about the time course of adaptation to strength training and, and what contributes to strength. So first of all, there is a rapid neuromuscular uh, change that results in a large amount of strength initially. And this depends on the difficulty of the task. Uh, so for example, there's a great study in 1998 by Chilibeck et al. And they looked at uh, the leg press, the bench press, and I believe uh, the bicep curl. And they found that the bicep curl strength uh, and the, the leg press and bench press strength increased very quickly. Uh, however, in the, uh, in the torso, so, the, so for example, the, the, the muscles related to the, the trunk, uh, related to the bench press and the leg press, uh, those muscle groups, uh, and, and then the legs as well, sorry, they did not hypertrophy initially despite a change in strength. However, in the bicep curl, there was a change very early uh, in, in the, the, the hypertrophy of the bicep along with those strength gains. So essentially when you're looking at multi-joint movements like a bench press or a leg press, uh, it takes longer to develop hypertrophy and that is because, well they hypothesize that is because the difficulty of the task is higher. Uh, there's a greater motor learning difficulty of these multi-joint movements. So in order to get hypertrophy, the, the motor learning has to occur first to properly overload the muscle to result in hypertrophy. So often, uh, or at least the thought is, is that in a higher difficulty task, that neurological adaptation will precede hypertrophy so that you can actually do enough work or enough stimulus with the, the, uh, the movement to actually create hypertrophy. And in a more complex movement, you can't quite generate enough overload because you're still learning it. So you want to get good, good with your movements and delaying your skill development or your motor skill can actually delay your hypertrophy. So the early stages of strength, especially like the first three weeks, are very much dominated um, by, by the neuromuscular adaptations. Um, and hypertrophy, while it does start happening from, from the get-go in terms of uh, you know, training, the first time you start lifting weights, you do start to have morphological adaptations, their contribution is very small relative to the very, very large neuromuscular change. So there was a pretty interesting study done by Erskine et al., and I'm probably mispronouncing that, 
recently uh, where they, they tried to familiarize their, the participants for the first three weeks, to, to, which was found to be the, the largest amount of neuromuscular adaptations in prior studies, that in the first three weeks that's really when the neuromuscular adaptations are dominant and hypertrophy is barely measurable. Uh, so they, they had everyone do this three weeks of uh, a familiarization with the movement. And then after that, uh, they tracked and, and f tried to figure out the relationship between strength and hypertrophy over 12 weeks or three months. And they found that the percentage change in strength was about 20% explained by the percentage change in muscle mass. Uh, and this was when corrected for 1RM. So they did a lot of things right here. So because both strength and muscle mass are not necessarily linear. So, uh, for example, my wife, when she first started, um, we'll say, bench pressing, it was probably about, oh, 30 kilos that she could do. Now she can bench press uh, close to 70 kilos. So that's a huge increase. However, the increase I've had as a male who started lifting weights at 80 kgs and now is around 95 kg. I've increased my bench press from where it started by more than her entire bench. So if we're trying to compare us, we wouldn't be on an even scale. So it is more appropriate to look at uh, things corrected for body mass or corrected to original 1RM. Uh, we're looking at a percentage change rather than using a raw value. So I think this is a very good way of looking at it, uh, using a percentage change and also uh, correcting to baseline 1RM. And they found that in the study, about 20% of the contribution to strength was explained by hypertrophy, or 20% of that variance. That may not seem like very much, but when you think about it, you know, over the, over the life course of a uh, power lifter, 20% of their strength gains is quite substantial and would be the difference between placing, say, first and 30th at a very high level. Now that said, that 20% is not the number that it stays the whole time. Obviously, you're doing a lot more motor learning and you're perfecting your form and you're getting a much better sense of how to train in terms of those neuromuscular adaptations over the long run. And that's why it's very interesting to look at a study by Appleby in 2012 uh, where they looked at pro rugby, uh, I believe, league players and long-term strength adaptations. We're talking about over two years in the bench press and the squat. And they found that as much as 44 to 77 percent of the strength change was, was explained uh, by hypertrophy. Now this study isn't perfect. They looked at what's known as basically a uh, fat-free mass index. They looked at lean mass index and instead of looking at regional hypertrophy and relating that to it, um, and the, the explanation of the variance in the bench press was actually a lot lower. So these are the squat numbers you're looking at. And if you look at the discussion, you can see that uh, their training, potentially due to injury on the team, they didn't increase their volume much at all on bench over the course of the two years, while squat did increase. So what I suspect happened is that the majority of the muscle mass change was in the legs, which is why the squat was more related uh, to the hypertrophy changes uh, in the full body, So, and, and which, which probably maybe inflated uh, the contribution uh, of, of the lean mass changes to the squat, maybe deflated them in the bench. So I would probably have more confidence looking at maybe the lower end uh, of this change and saying maybe it's 40% or something like that. And that's complete speculation and anecdotal uh, observation. But, but nonetheless, they found that the change in the squat, uh, 44 to 77% of it was explained, that variance was explained by uh, changes in muscle mass. So that's a lot more than 20%. Um, and, and I don't think it would be a bad estimation to say that at this high level of training, uh, because many of the neuromuscular adaptations have occurred and form is, is pretty drilled in, uh, that hypertrophy, even though it's a lot slower, you know, you gain a lot less muscle mass at this stage, but you are still gaining it, as they found, contributes a greater proportion uh, to, your, to your strength. Now, this is not to say uh, that all of a sudden you're gaining more muscle mass, not by any means. In fact, the amount of muscle mass you gain is you know, has diminishing returns, as does your strength, and, and that's because they're, they are related. Uh, so, but what it does mean is that you want to try to continually induce progressive overload over time, uh, and you have to be smart about your training. And if you do have an interest in strength, uh, you certainly can get stronger, even while losing size. So, for example, if you, put a, if you did a program where you're really emphasizing uh, the neuromuscular adaptation. So for example, let's say you did an intensity block of training where you're doing a lot of uh, 1RM testing or training, uh, something like the Bulgarian method. If you came from a higher volume background, you might even lose some size in that process. 
but whatever contribution muscle mass gave to uh, strength might be uh, that you lost would be less than the increase you'd get in strength from doing a highly specific uh, uh, you know, neuromuscular centric program essentially. Uh, this all depends on what you're previously adapted to and that example is probably best if you were to take an intermediate level bodybuilder and put him on a, uh, an intensity block and a powerlifting program. He might get a little smaller but also get stronger interestingly enough and that's because there's multiple things that contribute to strength and, um, and it's not just hypertrophy. So anyway, nonetheless, uh, it is important for the long run to make sure that you are not only providing the neuromuscular adaptations, uh, but also the raw material that those, neuro that those neuromuscular adaptations affect. Uh, and so you can produce more, more strength over time. So for the powerlifters out there, uh, you don't need to make hypertrophy your main focus, nor not at all, definitely not, uh, but it should be something that you think about. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit more about how hypertrophy contributes to strength. Well, in a most obvious sense, you know, larger muscles means that you have more contractile and non-contractile tissues that contribute to strength that we talked about in that, I believe, second slide. Uh, you know, um, and then the increased pination angle. Basically, this is a way to have better fiber packing. You know, you can get more fibers in, and, and changing the pination angle changes the transfer of force. But it's essentially a trade-off that ends up as a net win because you can get greater cross-sectional area. So there are changes to the actual architecture. Uh, there are changes to the, the total muscle. Both of these, of course, can give the, the body more raw material to contract and produce force. And then interestingly enough, and I've got to give a shout out to uh, Andrew Vygotsky on this one, um, there is a change in moment arm length. So if you think about, let's say, the bicep or the triceps hypertrophying, uh, because that muscle belly grows, it changes the angle with which the tendon thus attaches to the bone and potentially increasing by a small amount that moment arm. Uh, now, not to get into too heavy of biomechanics, what I mean by the moment arm is kind of like the, the lever, essentially. Um, and while an increased moment arm uh, has pros and cons for a power lifter, where you're trying to produce force at, at you know, what ends up being a slow speed, this can actually increase strength. And this is something they modeled in their study, Vygotsky et al. So essentially, hypertrophy not only directly but also indirectly can increase uh, maximal strength. Uh, it may not necessarily be a benefit to someone who wants a very fast contraction, uh, but it may have a net win. That's not my area, but for powerlifting, bodybuilding, uh, it's not always just the direct amount of cross-sectional uh, area that is, that is getting to contract and, and add to the summation of force production, uh, but also the biomechanical advantage it can give for slow speed strength. So it's, it's something you might not expect. I think it's interesting, but the point is hypertrophy does seem to contribute to strength based on the information we have thus far. It may not be as much as you think, uh, but 20% is still quite a lot, uh, even at the beginner level when you think about it. I'll give you an example of myself. I've increased my powerlifting total from the first year I powerlifted to now by about 120, 130 kilograms. So 20% of that uh, would be, say, 20, 25 kilos, and if we use those little higher numbers that we saw, the higher percentages that we saw in those rugged players, that would be as much uh, as, say, 50 kilos, which is a huge difference in terms of performance. If you were to take uh, someone who performs at even higher level than me, say Elaine Norton, who might have an 800 kg total and is winning the 93 kg class in the USAPL um, you know, nationals, and you take a look at his progress over time, that might be more something like a 60, 70, 80 kg change over a lifetime. And if you drop 80 kg off his total, now he's not in first place, he's closer to 10th. So it can make a very large difference and that's probably why such a large amount of the variance in powerlifting performance at an elite level is explained by muscle mass. So all right folks, that's it. Hopefully that made some sense. If not, well, make sure to read the studies. Next time, we'll talk about something else. Thank you for watching Science and Application with Eric Helms. Say what?